news of the defeat at Izandalwana had hit Britain hard. In response, a flood of reinforcements had arrived in Natal, with which Chelmsford prepared a second invasion of Zululand. Lord Chelmsford was aware by mid-June that Sir Garnet Wolseley had superseded his command of the British forces. Chelmsford was ordered by Her Majesty's government to submit and subordinate your plans to his control. Chelmsford ignored this along with various peace offers from Chechuayo. He wanted to strike while the Zulu were still recovering from their defeats and to attempt to regain his reputation before Walsley could remove him from command of the army. Chelmsford fielded two cavalry regiments, five batteries of artillery and 12 infantry battalions amounting to 1,000 regular cavalry, 9,000 regular infantry, and a further 7,000 men with 24 guns, including the first ever British Army Gatling gun battery. Eventually, on 3rd of June, the main thrust of the second invasion began its slow advance on Ulundi. Still hoping for an end to hostilities, King Kechweo refrained from attacking the extended and vulnerable supply lines. Consequently, the British advance was unopposed. As the force advanced, Techwayo dispatched envoys from Ulundi to the British. These envoys reached Chelmsford on the 4th of June with the message that Techwayo wished to know what terms would be acceptable to cease hostilities. Chelmsford sent a message back with the British terms in writing. By the 16th, the slow advance was quickened by the news that Wolseley was on his way to Natal to take command. On the 28th of June, Chelmsford's column was a mere 17 miles away from Olundi and had established supply depots when Sir Garnet Wolseley arrived in Cape Town. Wolseley had sent a message to Chelmsford ordering him not to undertake any serious actions against the Zulus. Chelmsford had no intention of letting Wolseley stop him from making a last effort to restore his reputation and did not reply. A second message was sent on the 30th of June which said the following. Concentrate your force immediately and keep it concentrated. Undertake no serious operations with detached bodies of troops. Acknowledge receipt of this message at once and flash back your latest moves. I am astonished at not hearing from you. Wolseley, straining to assert command over Chelmsford, tried to join 1st Division, lagging along the coast behind the main advance. At the very time Wolseley was riding north from Durban, Chelmsford was preparing to engage the enemy. Wolseley's efforts to reach the front had been in vain. On the same day, Chechuayo's representatives again appeared. These envoys bore some of what the British commander had demanded. Oxen, a promise of guns, and a gift of elephant tusks. The peace was rejected as the terms had not been fully met and Chelmsford turned the envoys away without accepting the elephant tusks and informed them that the advance would only be delayed one day to allow the Zulus to surrender one regiment of their army. With the invading enemy in sight, he knew no Zulu regiment would surrender, so Sechwayo sent a further hundred white oxen from his own herd along with Prince Napoleon's sword, which the Zulu had taken in the skirmish in which the prince had been killed. The Zulu Umsijo regiment, guarding the approaches to the White Umfalozi River, where the British were camped, refused to let the oxen pass, deeming it a useless gesture, seeing as it was impossible to meet all Chelmsford's demands. Fighting was inevitable. On the 3rd of July, with negotiations having broken down, Colonel Buller led a cavalry force across the river to scout out the ground beyond. Orders. 
a party of Zulus were seen herding goats near the Emberlane stream and troopers moved to round them up. On a hunch, Buller gave an order for them to stop and prepare to fire from the saddle and to not dismount Picture under any targets. circumstance. His instinct proved right, for 3,000 Zulus rose from the long grass. At that moment, three troopers were shot dead by the Zulus, and Bulla ordered his men to retire. As they dashed back to the river, their crossing was covered by the Transvaal Rangers on the opposite bank. This incident had placed the entire reconnaissance in grave danger, but Buller's alertness and leadership saved them from annihilation. Chelmsford was now convinced the Zulus wanted to fight and replied to Wolseley's third message, informing him that he would indeed retreat to 1st Division if the need arose, and that he would be attacking the Zulus the next day. That evening, Chelmsford issued his orders. The British, having learned a bitter lesson at his Sandalwana, would take no chances meeting the Zulu army in the open with their normal line of battle, such as the Thin Red Line. He formed his infantry into a large hollow square with mounted troops covering the sides and rear. Neither wagon lagers nor trenches would be used to convince both the Zulus and critics that a British square could, quote, beat them fairly in the open. The British force included two Gatling guns and several cannons. Within the square were headquarters staff, number five company of the Royal Engineers, led by Lieutenant Chard, the second native Natal contingent, a rearguard of two squadrons of the 17th Lancers, and a troop of Natal right. native horse followed. No Zulus in any numbers had been sighted by 8 a.m., so the frontier light horse were sent forth to provoke the enemy. Mounted troops by the stream opened fire from the saddle in an attempt to trigger a premature charge before retreating back to the main British force. The Zulu army under the command of Umantwana Ziwedu Kampande, around 15,000 strong, now stood in a horseshoe shape encircling the north, east and southern sides of the square. They were made up of both veterans and novices with varying degrees of confidence. The British were ready and the Zulu troops faced concentrated fire. Zulu regiments had to charge forward directly into massed rifle fire non-stop fire from the Gatling guns and the artillery fire at point-blank range. Charges were made by the Zulus in an attempt to get within close range, but they could not prevail against the British fire. There were several casualties within the square to Zulu marksmen, but the British firing did not waver and no warrior was able to get within 30 yards of the British ranks. The Zulu reserve force now rose and charged against the southwest corner of the square. Nine pounders tore great chunks out of this body while the infantry opened fire. 
The speed of the charge made it seem as if the Zulu reserves would get close enough to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but no warrior reached the British ranks. After half an hour of concentrated fire from the artillery, the Gatling guns, and thousands of British riflemen, the Zulu military power was broken. British casualties were 10 killed and 87 wounded, while nearly 500 Zulu dead were counted around the square. Another 1,000 or more were wounded. Chelmsford ordered the cavalry to mount and the 17th Lancers, 1st King's Dragoon Guards, Colonial Cavalry, Native Horse and 2nd Natal. Native contingent charged the now fleeing Zulus. The pursuit continued until not a live Zulu remained on the Mahlabatini plain, with soldiers killing the Zulu wounded in revenge for similar Zulu actions at Isandlwana. Chelmsford ordered the royal kraal of Ulundi to be burnt. The capital of Zululand burned for days. Chelmsford turned over command to Wolseley on 15th of July at the fort at St. Paul's, leaving for home on the 17th. Chelmsford had partially salvaged his reputation and received a Knight Grand Cross of Bath, largely because of Ulundi. However, he was severely criticized by the Horse Guards investigation and he would never serve in the field again. Setshwayo, the Zulu king, was captured on 28th August 1879 and taken into exile in Cape Colony. The British established a regime in Zululand considered to be sympathetic to Britain and withdrew from Zululand.